bit again. Uh, again, thanks for having me here. I, I come with a, with a pretty simple message, uh, and yet it's a, a message that is uh, very much outside the box of normal living today. Uh, the simple message that I'll take 50 minutes to explain can be summed up in one sentence. Uh, and the one sentence is this, uh, that there is more joy to be found in owning less than we can ever find constantly pursuing more. There is more joy to be found in owning less than we can ever find pursuing more. Uh, this is a message that is very much countercultural, uh, is very much different than the society that we live in. Um, uh, most, uh, seems like most of the world, seems like most uh, culture, uh, looks at people merely as uh, consumers and, and kind of pieces of this wheel that are continually buying and selling and um, moving uh, possessions to and fro. Um, as a result, actually, actually, I'll take a step back. The, uh, the statistics are pretty unbelievable when you think about it. Um, we see, on average, 5,000 advertisements every single day. Uh, and every single advertising message, uh, at its core, has the same foundational truth. Every advertising message tries to tell us tries to convince us that we are not as happy, we are not as fulfilled as we could be unless we bought whatever they were selling. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, it's uh, cars or clothes or technology, uh, vacations, insurance, whatever it is, that we will be better off if we buy whatever they're selling. And I, I think uh, because since the day we were born, we've been told this message so many times, and from people who are so good at it, that we start to believe it, uh, and we start to buy in, uh, without even realizing it. Uh, as a result, we start spending these lives where we're constantly chasing uh, more and more money, where we're constantly chasing bigger houses, and nicer cars, and more trendier fashion, and cooler technology, and better toys, and uh, this is what our life slowly, unintentionally becomes. I think when someone comes along with, a, again, just this, this very simple message that there's actually more joy to be found in owning less, uh, it, it resonates with us, uh, it resonates in our hearts, and it, it rings true in our soul. And, um, so maybe, maybe more than anything else, I'm, I'm here just to remind you of, of what you already know to be true. I want to start this evening, uh, this afternoon, by uh, sharing my story, I'm going to share my story, and then we'll have a little back and forth discussion, and then... Uh, I'll take some questions at the end, so let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, I grew up in a very middle-class uh, American suburban lifestyle. I uh, was never missing meals, never eating at the fanciest restaurants in the, in the town, but uh, very middle-class. I've been married for 17 years. Um, uh, over my married life, I can point to four significant pay increases that I've had from different jobs and different uh, transitions. Uh, and yet, for some reason, I was, I was never able to get ahead financially. Uh, seems like whenever I started making more, we just started spending more. Um, and so that, that never really sat well with me. I've always kind of had a little, um, I call it a, a stream of discontent. I've always been a little discontented with the use of my money. Um, I don't know if anyone can relate. I'm a little, little discontented with the with the use of my money, not not just how much I was spending that I couldn't get ahead, but um, also a little bit of who I was spending my money on, um, knowing that so much of my money was just being spent on myself um, rather than being the, the generous person that, that I would prefer to be. So I was a little discontented with the with the use of my money. Um, I was also a little discontented with. Uh, I've begun to describe it as this. Uh, I was growing discontented with the focus of my life's energy, which is a phrase that I never would have been able to use had it not been for a Saturday morning eight years ago when I was living in Vermont. Um, in, uh, in Vermont, of course, we have this really long winter, um, we have this really short spring, uh, we have a couple weeks of summer, and then fall and winter starts again. Maybe you know how that goes. <laughs> anyway, we had this uh, holiday weekend, uh, and it had been this long winter in the spring. My wife and I decided we were going we to do our spring cleaning on this particular weekend. 
Uh, I offered to clean out the garage. I thought it sounded um, manly and, and tough. Uh, I also had a five-year-old son who I thought would enjoy cleaning out the garage with his father. Um, just such a dad thing to think that he would, he would enjoy this. But anyway, I, uh, I get my five-year-old son, Salem. Uh, I get him up early. Uh, we go down. We have this nice breakfast I cooked for him. And he's like, what's going on? I'm like, we've got this great project we're going to do today. We're going to clean out the garage. Doesn't that sound exciting? <clears throat> and uh, so we go out to the garage. It's been right, everything kind of dirty and dusty and everything disorganized. Just how things get... And uh, I said, Salem, let's, let's grab everything, let's pull it out into the driveway, we'll hose it all down, we'll return everything in this nice, organized fashion. He nodded his head uh, like he knew what I was talking about. Um, and I said, hey, can you go grab that blue box and, and pull it out into the driveway? Uh, which ended up being a, a pretty big mistake because the box was full of all of his toys. <laughs> What a foolish thing for me to ask him to grab. I should have started with the hose. But there's his baseball bat and frisbees and like stuff he hadn't seen for six months over the winter. And of course, like any five-year-old, the last thing he wants to do is clean when he would be playing instead. So he grabs his bat and he says, hey, can I go play in the backyard? And I'm like, oh, man, we were going to bond today. Like, yes, you can go, you can go play. So he ran, um, he turned to run in the backyard. Just before he did, though, like any five-year-old son would, he turns and says, and will you come play with me? And I said, no, I'm not going to come play with you. We're, we're cleaning out the garage, right? This is what responsible people do. We take care of our things. So he goes off in the backyard, and I start working on the garage. Um, I'm doing one thing, leads to another project, leads to another project. Hours later, I'm, I'm still working on the same garage. Uh, Salem's coming up about every 20, 30 minutes, asking me to come play with him. I keep pushing him off. Just a second, just a second. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. <clears throat> That's how parents do it. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Well, he's running back and forth. Um, at the same time, my... Next door neighbor, her name is June. She's 80 years old. She's doing all of her yard work, uh, which has now become like a bucket list item for me. <coughs> uh, wife would do the yard work when she's 80. Um, she's doing all this. Uh, she's doing all this raking leaves and pulling weeds and, and everything. And uh, at one point, she's watching. I think what's taking place and seeing. I don't know the frustration growing on my shoulders as this project continues just to, to take up, take up time. And at one point, we, we walk past each other, and she makes this uh, very sarcastic comment. Uh, she says, oh, the joys of owning a home. And uh, I said, yeah, well, you know what they say, the more stuff you own, the more your stuff owns you, uh, which I think I had read on a cat poster somewhere at some point <laughs> in, in my life. Um, Never really understood what it meant, but still had, had heard the phrase before. And, and she responds with this absolutely life-changing sentence. She says to me, yeah, you know, that's why my daughter is a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And I stood speechless for a moment, as if this was the first time in the world somebody had told me that I didn't have to try to own everything. And I, I remember looking over my driveway, and here's this pile, just this, this pile of junk, a, a pile of dirty, dusty things I'd spent all morning taking care of. Uh, I knew full well that my possessions weren't making me happy, right? Like, we'd all admit that our things aren't making us happy. <laughs> But I'm looking at the pile of things in my driveway, out of the corner of my eye, I see my five-year-old son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard. And suddenly I had this realization that not only was everything I owned not making me happy, but everything I owned was actually taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness in life. And not just happiness, but purpose and fulfillment as well. That's a very different realization, right? Not just our things aren't making us happy, but all the things we own are actually making us less happy by keeping us from the things that do. <clears throat> 
uh, like my life changed in a, in a second. I, I, I thanked June for the conversation. I, I ran inside and found my wife. I think was cleaning one of the, the bathrooms at the time. And uh, I'm like, Kim, you'll never guess this conversation I had with June. She said we don't have to own all this stuff. <laughs> She had spent all morning cleaning, uh, taking care of my two-year-old at the time. While she was cleaning, I think she, like, I caught her right at the right moment. And she was like, you know what? That sounds really good right about now. I said, I know. Doesn't it sound amazing? So um, just like any you know, person in the 21st century, I ran to the computer <laughs> and I typed in, what is minimalism? Because I, I wanted to know more about it. And up pops, interestingly enough, up pops all this uh, minimalist art and minimalist architecture and minimalist music where people are trying to accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish by using the, the least amount of resources or, or notes or whatever to get there. I'm like, mm, I'm not so interested in, in that. And so I, I changed my search and I said, what is a minimalist lifestyle? And up pops this whole world to me of people all around the globe who have had this novel idea that they are going to own only the things that they need to own and they're going to get rid of everything else. And every single one of them was singing the praises of this decision that they had made. Um, now, it didn't take me too long to find out there were people all over the world doing this and I noticed that they were all doing it a little bit differently. So I read about this guy named Colin, uh, Colin Wright. Uh, Colin is in his 20s. Everything Colin owns fits in a backpack. Uh, Colin loves traveling, and so Colin moves to a new country every four months. And, uh, and to make it even better, the readers of his website vote as to which country he's going to move to next. So he's been to like Iceland, like anywhere you would send a stranger on the internet. He's been to all these crazy places, and uh, he's talking about how, you know, just Everything fits in a backpack. It's great. I can get up and I can move and I can go anywhere I want. And I'm like, you know what? That sounds kind of fun, um, but I don't know. I, I kind of like my country. <laughs> I kind of like my neighborhood. I kind of like the relationships. I like the people that I have in my life. Like, maybe that works for you, but I'm not looking to move every four months. I read about a guy named Dave Bruno. Uh, Dave Bruno at the time lived in San Diego. He um, took upon himself this self-imposed 100 thing challenge. Uh, started blogging about it, Newsweek, and Time, and like all these different publications found out about it and did stories on it. Uh, his goal was to get down to owning just 100 things. And so literally he had a sheet of paper and he numbered it 1 to 100 and he, he broke down every item that he owned and he got rid of anything over 100. It was like, like purple t-shirt, wetsuit, surfboard, right, like San Diego, so he had the priority straight. Um, and then he got, he got rid of everything else. And he's talking about how much he learned through the process, how much his life has benefited. And again, I was, I was reading it, and I was fascinated by how he was living out minimalism. But again, I thought to myself, hold on a moment. I, I'd like to own less stuff, but I... I don't think I want a sheet of paper with everything I own listed on it. Like, this isn't, that seems more burdensome than just taking care of my garage a couple times a year. That's not exactly what I'm looking for, but I can see why it would be beneficial for you. And I met another couple I read about online, um, a couple out of Portland named Logan and Tammy Strobel. Uh, Logan and Tammy Strobel had like $30,000 in debt and plus they had this mortgage and student loans. And they decided more than anything else, they wanted to get out of debt. And so they moved out of their home, they sold their home, they moved into a 200 square foot tiny home, and uh, between them, uh, they had just 100 things. <coughs> so between them, it was like two cups, two plates, one cat, somehow made the list. <laughs> they got down to just 100 things between them. Again, they were like, this is amazing, we got rid of all of our debt, we feel so free, we're able to travel, we're able to, to go where we want to go, this was the... Like, we love the decision we made. Um, and I'm, again, I'm reading it, and I'm like, I, I can see why that would work for you, but I don't know. I probably need more than two cups for my family of four. At the very least, I need four cups, or I need four plates and four forks. But beyond that, we had, um, I was very involved in our, in our church at the time. We had a number, like, we had a number of different small groups that were meeting in our home. 
Uh, we loved having people over that were new to the neighborhood. We'd have them over for dinner. I was doing some, like, some premarital counseling with some people before they got married. We'd have them over for dinner. And I'm like, it even seems like four isn't enough if I want to keep doing these things that are so important to me. How about eight plates? How about eight cups? Like, that seems to work for my life. And so I learned uh, two very important things that day. Uh, number one, that, that, that minimalism looks very different from person to person, right? Uh, uh, I would say a minimalist writer, as myself, is going to own something very different than a minimalist artist, or even a minimalist auto mechanic is going to have to own different tools than I'm going to own, just because of uh, the lives that we live. But beyond that, minimalism is essentially about purpose. Minimalism is about values. Minimalism is about what do I want to accomplish with my life? What is most important to me? Where do I find joy? Where do I find fulfillment? Where do I find purpose? What do I need to own in order to do more of that? And then what is everything else I've been accumulating that's actually distracting me from? And this looks very different from person to person. This even looks different from a college student to a parent to a grandparent. This looks very different from person to person. Uh, this became our, our definition of minimalism. Uh, minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of anything that distracts us from it. Minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things we most value and the removal of anything that distracts us from it. So if this is the kind of the mindset and the idea, we, we began going through our home and just room by room, um, going room by room, what, what don't I need? What can I get rid of? What, what doesn't need to be here? And uh, this was a, a, pro a, a nine or ten month long process for us. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. I guess some people do it overnight, but for most people it seems to take uh, a while. Actually, uh, a couple years later, three or four years later, we actually ended up moving into a smaller home and we found even more things that we were able to get rid of. Uh, by making that transition. Well, if I were to go back to that uh, very original um, Saturday, uh, that evening I call my mom. Uh, I'm in Vermont. She's in South Dakota, so halfway across the country. And uh, I'm like, Mom, you'll never guess, we have decided to become minimalists. And uh, she says, Oh, Joshua. <laughs> uh, she goes, I was, I was just watching Oprah. Do you have Oprah in Canada? <laughs> so you all know where I'm at. Um, I, was, I was just watching Oprah, and she was interviewing some minimalists. Did you know that minimalists don't go to the grocery store, but they get their food out of dumpsters? <laughs> and, uh, no. I did not read that anywhere in the literature. I guess I should have read the fine print that I could no longer go to the grocery store. Well, I've uh, I've since come to learn that there are that there are people who set out to not spend any money on food, and they are called freegans. Uh, that's a that's a real term. Freegans. They don't spend any money on food. Different than vegans. Different than minimalists. Um, but uh, but my wife, my mother was getting a, a, a little bit confused there. Um, so anyway, I literally, because of that conversation, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to start a website. Uh, it's just going to be like a journal, it's going to be a diary, what I'm getting rid of, what I'm keeping, what I'm learning, uh, what I'm noticing. Um, more, than, more than anything, I, I wanted like a, a kind of track record of the change that we were making, and I wanted my mom to know we were still buying, I don't know, FDA approved produce for, for grandchildren. But uh, I started a website, uh, Becoming Minimalist. Dot com, dot com was the decision that we made, it seemed to be the, the perfect name, so that was uh, what I started, just a free WordPress website at the time. Uh, I was shocked to find out how many people were interested in this, in this journey. Uh, more and more people started reading it, and now we have over one million people a month uh, that stopped by Becoming Minimalist to, to read. Uh, at some point it became a, a, a website where I wasn't just talking about my journey, but I began using it to encourage and, and help and inspire others. And uh, I think one of the things that I've, that I've learned through the, 
through the growth of this website is that, that this is a message that people are drawn to, uh, that, that, um, that we, we've kind of over-accumulated for so many years that when someone starts talking about owning less, uh, most people are drawn to that and like, yes, I want that to be true in my life as well. One of the, uh, one of the reoccurring uh, themes on, on becoming minimalist when I first started writing is as, as I began getting rid of stuff, uh, I started noticing some very, um, some very practical ways that my life was getting better. Like, as I owned less, my life was improving. And every time I noticed something, I, I would write about it. And I would, I would include a little uh, entry into the blog. And uh, ultimately, I found that this is a very fascinating question to ask. And so I'm, I'm just going to ask you, and I'm going to have you, I don't know, if you're close to someone, maybe turn to a neighbor, if you're all by yourself, make a list. But here is the question. If you were to own less stuff, in what ways... Would you see life improve? Or maybe you're young and you're just starting out, and so the, the question would be tailored, it would be a little bit different. And you said, okay, if I did not live a life of accumulating more than I needed, what would that mean for my future? What would be some of the benefits to my life? So what are the benefits today, or what would be the benefits in the future? So let me give you like three minutes. Wherever you are, just turn to your neighbor and, and make a short list. How would your life improve if you owned less stuff, either now or in the future? Go, and then I'll have you yell them out to me. And I got a list in front of me, but uh, maybe you can add to it. Uh, what do you got? What's one thing that popped up in your conversation? How, how, how might your life improve in very practical ways? Go ahead. Uh, less stress and then something funny you said. Pick, less stress picking an outfit. Okay. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, actually, so let me... Uh, I'll just take these answers and run with them. So, actually, you have two there. Uh, you have you have less stress. Uh, Randy Alcorn is a, a, a writer I like, and, and he makes the statement where he says, uh, every, incre every increased possession adds increased anxiety onto our lives. Uh, which is very true, right? Like, every single thing that we own has to be taken care of. It has to be dealt with. At some point, someone has to take care of everything we own. And, uh, and so, and, and and not just that, but even the whole idea of, of physical clutter um, adds stress onto our lives. And you can, like, you can picture it just by closing your eyes and, and putting yourself like mentally in the most cluttered room in, in your home, uh, the most cluttered room that you can think of, right? Like just all the stuff around us just adds stress, and then we multiply it over the course of our homes. Um, so we have less stress by owning less, so more calm and more peace. And then um, less stress by um, picking out an outfit, um, like there's there's legitimacy to that. There's this whole idea of um, decision fatigue. Uh, this whole idea that the more decisions we make every single day, uh, each decision becomes a little less in quality. Uh, the more decisions we have to make, the, the worse decisions we make ultimately uh, over the course of a day. So there's this like this very growing movement of people who have decided that they are going to just wear the same thing every single day. Uh, not the same, like, sh actual shirt, but they have several of them, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg, of course, is a very popular. Uh, Steve Jobs is a very good example. Um, uh, uh, our, uh, our current president, Barack Obama, just he had, like just two different color suits that he's decided that he's gonna wear. Uh, one of the female editors of the New York Times. Like, this is a very growing movement of people who have decided uh, that they just want to have one less decision that they want to make over the course of the day, um, and uh, and not only that, when you're um, uh, when you're when you when you own fewer clothes, it's like everything you 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 have in your closet you like you enjoy, um, you tend to pick out clothing that's um, slimming. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, I just hijacked your answer in a whole bunch of ways. Okay. Okay, easier to move, uh, easier to get up and, and, uh, and move, and this could be uh, in a couple of ways. I mean, just like in short term, right? It's easier to, to get out and go around if you don't have a, a whole bunch of stuff in your house that you need someone to take care of, you gotta watch over. Uh, but certainly life changes and, and moving from one place to another permanently uh, becomes that much easier, so much more freedom in life. Yep. <laughs> Less time looking for stuff. Um, 
I, uh, it, it's actually uh, very early on, <clears throat> I'll, sh I'll share a story, because uh, it was kind of this light bulb moment for me. <clears throat> so this was May, this was um, uh, in May where we made this decision. Uh, like just weeks later, in, I was in Vermont and I, I was a track and field judge. I, I caught the javelin. I measured, I measured the javelin, that was my job, and uh, there was the big state track and field competition was coming to, uh, coming to uh, our area, and so that was my job for the morning. I wake up Saturday morning, and it's raining. Uh, track and field doesn't stop for the rain, and um, so I'm like, where is my umbrella? And I looked all, I'm running a little bit late, I looked through all my closets, I looked everywhere, I could not find my umbrella. And finally, like in one coat closet at the very bottom, I found this blue one. I just grabbed it and I rushed out the door. And I, I, get, <laughs> I get to my spot on the field and I, I pull open my umbrella and it's got this big Alliance Woman logo <laughs> on it. And um, I'm like, how appropriate that I got this, like, this big Alliance Woman uh, umbrella that I'm holding out in the out of the event all day, like the biggest track and field event of the of the summer. And uh, I'm like, man, I if I owned less, this would be easier, right? I would know where my stuff is. I would know what I have, and I wouldn't be having to to wrestle with that. So, thanks. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I would. I'm, I'm thankful that uh, I. <clears throat> Hardly ever do people mention the environment when, when I do this, when I do this back and forth. Um, and I, I usually have to catch it at the end. I'm like, I'm better for the environment. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, better for the environment. Um, right, so, so we break out of this, this cycle of, of consuming and, and discarding and, and just moving on and on. Uh, it's actually very, I, I, I wish the environmental movement would, would take some cues from me. <laughs> I've, uh, I've said this before, um, and I've told people, but, um, but it's very interesting how, in many ways, this idea of consuming less, right? Like, we all know it benefit uh, society, it benefit the world long term. Um, and yet, for some reason, it, it always seems to be that that seems to be the, 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 um, the packaging of that conversation, right? Make sacrifices, consume less, it'll be better for the environment, it'll be better for everyone long term. Um, but uh, but I think they miss out on a like on a very uh, like a very personal appeal when you start talking about owning less and how it results in less stress, how it results in better living overall for the individual person. Uh, like I think that becomes uh, far more appealing to a lot of people, right? Like what is my what is my personal benefit uh, for consuming less? So certainly, as more and more people move towards this minimalist lifestyle, we, we break out of some of that, uh, break out some of that cycle. But we don't make sacrifices to get there. Just the opposite. Our life gets better because we're less distracted by material things, uh, able to focus uh, more on, on what matters most. Uh, yeah, and, and speaking of that, just how much time do we spend taking taking care of our stuff, right? How much uh, how much time goes into cleaning and organizing and, and managing? And uh, you know, certainly if you if you've lived in that world a little bit, right? If you've ever had to take care of a house and take care of your stuff, you you know how much time and effort and energy goes into that. Uh, not to mention how um, removing those decisions and, and uh, just frees up our life in so many different ways. Our energy and our Time. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Concerning. Um, um, yeah. There's a. Um, <clears throat> it caught me off guard. Uh, I I wasn't expecting it. Um, but you're you're right when you say. The less quantity of stuff you own, the more quality items you're able to have. If I don't need three or four different watches, then I can have one very nice watch. And this actually, I, I noticed it when I was cleaning out one of my drawers. 
and there were like four or five sets of headphones in there. And I, and I bought a cheap pair and it broke, and I bought another cheap pair and it broke, and another cheap pair and it broke. And uh, I'm like, man, if I just would have got like one very nice set of headphones, if headphones is something that I need, uh, then it's worth the investment of, of having that. Um, uh, there are some people who adopt minimalism uh, because of frugality, right? Because they don't like spending money, they are minimalist um, and they pursue it because of that. But, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, people spend a lot of money becoming minimalist, um, and, um, <clears throat> but uh, that's certainly one of, the, one of the pieces of it. And then what was the other thing you said? Oh, space, right? Less, less space. Um, in, a, in America, over the last 50 years, uh, the average home has, has almost tripled in size. And uh, I looked up the, uh, the Canadian numbers. Uh, this is fascinating to me because it's, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not. In 1974, the average Canadian home was 1,000 square feet. By the mid-2000s, it was over 2,300 square feet. In less than 30 years, the average Canadian home uh, more than doubled in size, and uh, I don't think it's still true today, Australia has the biggest homes currently, but there was a stretch where Canada uh, ranked the, the largest in the world um, in terms of uh, five-room houses. There were more five-room houses uh, in Canada than, uh, than anywhere else, or at least per capita, which is a very, uh, very interesting statistic when you think about it. Maybe, maybe we don't need bigger houses, we just need uh, less stuff. Uh, let me uh, let me mention a, a couple others. Um, uh, money, uh, we would have we would have more money available. Uh, whether that means we're able to get get out of debt, uh, the average Can 50 percent of Canadians live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, actually, I think the statistic is 50 percent of Canadians say they would be in big trouble if their next paycheck was delayed just one week. Uh, like this is how slim the margins are that we're living. We we get it and we spend it. We get it and we spend it. We can break out of that cycle. Uh, we can get out of debt um, if that's where we are. We can start saving uh, if that's what we want to do. We, be, we can become more generous with our money. I'm pretty convinced that what 99.9% .9 of us want to be generous people. Don't we want to be generous? Don't we want to help those who need to be helped? Uh, we want to support causes that, that we believe in. Um, it seems like some people just don't think they have the finances to do it. Uh, when in reality, as we start owning less, uh, we start, start finding some of that, some of that margin. Um, and I would also mention um, <clears throat> that when I began um, deciding that, that I was happier owning less and, and wanted to own less, this didn't happen right away, uh, but there, be, there came this, this very significant shift in how I viewed work and how I viewed my career. Because so much of our culture, so much of our society, for so often our thinking is, I go to work so I can make as much money as possible so I can buy the bigger house or uh, the, the vacations or, or retire early or whatever. But, uh, but when you think about it, uh, when work becomes purely selfish in its motivation, it doesn't become all that fulfilling. Uh, I mean, the money is good, the money is fun, but it, eventually the, the happiness from money kind of fades away. But when you think about this whole, whole idea of work in the first place, right, the whole idea of distribution of labor, it wasn't selfish in its motivation. It wasn't selfish in its very beginning. Right? There were all these people and, and everyone was farming and hunting and building and then uh, at one point, some guy says, hey, you know what? I'm better at hunting, and you're better at farming, and Chuck is good at building. How about, Chuck, how about you build houses? How about you do farming? I'll do the hunting. We'll all come back, and we'll trade. I'll trade my hunting for the fruits. We'll trade the fruits for the houses, and we'll have so-and-so. Um, so, right? And in this way, everyone's doing what they're good at, all of society benefits, and we all move forward as people and as a society and as a civilization. It was purely selfless, right? It was, I'm doing what I'm good at so that everyone else can be doing what they're good at. And for some reason, somewhere along the way, 
we totally switched our mindset. And work became, what can I do to make the most amount of money for myself and for my family, as opposed to, what can I do that benefits everyone around me? But when we start to view work selflessly like that, when we start to think, I'm, I'm not just here for the, the, the most expensive car that I can get, but I want to love the people around me, I want to bring joy, I want to serve the people around me, that this is when work becomes um, far more enjoyable, far more fulfilling, uh, rather than something that we're all just trying to get out of uh, as quickly as possible today. Anyway, that's a completely different tangent. Um, that even, uh, just, uh, I, I found the, the basis for that whole thinking of this idea of, of minimalism. So, um, became a better example for my kids. I found that I was comparing myself less with others. I found more contentment. I found more generosity. I found more gratitude. Uh, here's ultimately what I found. Uh, I found that as I began owning less and I had more time and money and energy and focus, uh, I was able to start living a more intentional lifestyle focused on the things that bring me joy. I was able to pursue my passions. I was, uh, I was struck... Um, we, uh, we started taking stuff to the, the local charities and, and dropping things off. And uh, I found that, uh, that the first like, van load of stuff felt really good, and the second van load of stuff felt, felt great. Uh, but by about the, the third or fourth van load of things that I was dropping off at, at charities around town, uh, I started to ask myself some pretty difficult questions. Uh, starting with why why did I have three van loads of things in my house that I didn't need? Like why uh, why in the first place did I buy all this stuff that I don't need? Why why do we live lives of of, of excess <laughs> consumerism in the first place? Certainly there's there's marketers and certainly there's uh, this culture that's kind of feeding into us externally. Um, but the more I started looking inside, and the more I started uh, self-reflecting, the more I started noticing some things uh, about myself. Um, that, that maybe I was a little more jealous than I would have admitted. That, uh, that maybe I was a little more greedy and selfish than, than I would have admitted. That um, maybe I was trying to impress people with the things that I owned. That uh, maybe I really was trying to... Um, to show my success and, and to prove my worth by the, the brand of clothing that I was buying or the, the specific neighborhood that I lived in, that, that actually my identity was far more tied up in that pile of stuff in my driveway uh, than I ever would have admitted. Um, the, uh, the journey of, of learning things about myself um, was, was far more difficult, uh, far more unexpected, and yet far more worthwhile than I ever imagined it would be. And, uh, and it all spurred from this idea of, uh, of deciding to own less stuff and to do it purposefully. So I'm going to, um, <clears throat> let me just offer, let me offer one closing thought and then I'll, I'll take some questions. Um, for those of you who are like, you're, you're established, you've, you've got the home and there's too much stuff in it, uh, man, just like just grab a bag and a box and just start going through your house and, and getting rid of things, uh, and then go find like an easy place to start. Try your car, try your living room, like like try an easy place where you can get rid of stuff uh, and start noticing how how much you like it better uh, without clutter around, and then kind of carry that on through the rest of the house. But uh, um, since we're at a at college, like a, a quick message to those of you who. Well, you haven't bought the big house yet, you know, you, you got stuff in your dorm room, but it's not like you're, you got this mortgage payment of weighing over you and um, you don't have a garage full of stuff. Uh, let me say this, uh, you, you will never regret um, deciding to reject the, the cultural norm of consumerism. Uh, it, is, it is ingrained in us from the moment that, that we are born, uh, and there has to be at some point in your life where you say, I, I am going to reject that idea. Uh, that I, uh, this really good looking guy one time told me about minimalism, and, uh, and I'm in. Like, I, I agree with what he was saying, that's what I want my life to look like. Uh, you have to make that decision, I, I think you should make that decision today. However, I think it's also a decision that you're going to have to make later. 
Uh, I think once you're out of school, once you have your first job, once the income starts coming in and you're able to start affording all of those things, uh, again, you're going to have to revisit this idea and revisit this mindset and ask yourself, is it, is it really worth it? Um, and I think the more that you, you notice, like the, the more you look around and the more you see the advertisements, the more you see how people are just wasting their lives pursuing things that don't matter in the long run, uh, the easier that decision is going to be uh, when you reach that age. And then just going back to what I was saying before, man, pursue work that matters. Uh, like find something to do with your life that, that isn't based on the, the size of the paycheck uh, that you're gonna receive. Uh, but pursue work that, that adds meaning um, into your life, that serves other people, uh, that benefits others. That doesn't mean you can't end up making a lot of money, uh, but when you do, uh, let's, let's be smart and, and let's look, look for places to spend it uh, and use it that, that would bring us a lasting joy rather than temporal pleasure. So let me uh, let me close with that, and I'll just take some questions. We've probably got some five, six, seven minutes. Go ahead. How do you see uh, the economy changing with, uh, like, overnight, if you're going to go to the what happened, maybe a lot of people out of jobs who make the factory stuff. So how do you see that shift for the economy to change if everyone were to, to uh, shift to a minimalist yeah. attitude? Yeah, uh, that is a great question. Um, and I have two answers. Uh, my first one, I, I hate saying, but I, I should be honest and say, uh, as much as I wish everyone would overnight begin living a minimal lifestyle, I, I don't see that happening. Um, this, is, this, will, this will take time and, and effort and, and movement going there. Um, the, the second answer is, <clears throat> um, I see a very different economy emerging. Um, minimalism doesn't mean that you're not spending money. Minimalism doesn't mean that you're not earning money. It means that you're spending money on different things and different stuff and different pursuits than, than just things that are going to pile up in your driveway or in your garage. And so, like a very classic example, right, just experiences, right? So I would, I would much rather spend my money uh, taking my family canoeing or camping or even to a concert, right? Like having that type of experience rather than um, just buying another pair of jeans. And so the economy could shift, right? And, and there's less manufacturing, there's more service type stuff. Uh, I would hope, I would think that you would find more, um, uh, um, what would be the word, uh, more altruistic economies that, that come up, right? More um, more nonprofits that are beginning to emerge, um, more um, more businesses that are they're trying to solve problems around the world. And so money could still be flowing hands, and certainly there'd be a hiccup, I think, getting there. Uh, but I think that the uh, economy could look very different without, you know, suffering. How are you able to break the relationship between you and your That's what I feel like it's happening. If I try to do it, like this, Um, what I began to discover uh, was that those things um, weren't uh, those things weren't making me happy. But even worse, uh, my my tie to those things, uh, the fact that I continue to keep that thing around, carrying it around and around, uh, was actually not bringing value into my life. It was actually it was actually dragging me down. Uh, it was actually keeping me from being in the backyard with, with my son. Um, so that's that's where I got there. And it's it was easy with with easy things to get rid of. Um, and I, I wouldn't say like the stuff that you're very emotionally tied to that, that you begin there. Right? Start with the easier stuff and begin to see how, how your life is freer. Uh, and then I wanted to apply that in, in more and more places and, and more and more things to the point where um, where I didn't have those ties because I, I would much rather be doing something else. Good. So I have two kids. Uh, they're now 14 and 10. Um, so eight, eight years ago, um, and uh, and they're very different. Uh, my son was five, and actually he was he was very much on board with with it. Actually, and, and my wife was. Uh, my wife is probably a different level than I was. If I wanted to get rid of 80 percent of our stuff, she wanted to get rid of 50 or 60 percent. And so like, the first 50 or 60 percent felt good. I'm like, let's go through the house again. She's like, whoa, whoa, I think we're at a good point. 
Um, so you kind of learn to compromise in there. Um, my son, uh, so probably my daughter is, is a little harder now. Uh, she's 10 and she likes stuff. My son's pretty happy with a soccer ball. Um, but, uh, but my daughter's different. And so, um, number one, I, I, I didn't start with their stuff. You know, like, I think I always tell parents that. It's unfair to be the first thing you're going to declutter is all your kids' things. <laughs> like, you got to do your own, and you got to go through the process. Uh, they see you do that. You, you learn how to solve it. You learn the emotions that come up. Uh, and then, and then you, you learn how to have that conversation. And so my daughter would like more and more things, but she understands why we, why we don't. Um, and whether she agrees with it all or not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But we, we try to set boundaries and empower her. And like, you can have as much clothes as you want to fit in your dresser. Pick whatever clothes you want. But once it overflows, we're going to have to you know, make some changes. So um, helping set some physical boundaries and empowering them to make decisions about what's important inside of that. Um, sociology and psychology folks up here. Uh, I think there are, <clears throat> I think that there are countless things that, that factor into it. Um, personality, uh, upbringing, um, <clears throat> even even some of the things that, 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 that bring us joy, you know, some things require more possessions than others. So I, I think there's a lot of different factors that, that play into it. Um, and, and they're not always the same. Like I can talk to someone who who grew up in a hoarding household, and they become hoarders because of it. And I can talk to their brother or sister who grew up in a hoarding household, and like they don't want anything to do with it, and they're they're all into minimalism. Uh, so even those things factor very differently. Um, concerning that that kind of little bit, of what I'm talking about that that self reflection uh, that, that begins to take place by owning less. And even as you ask the question, I could see myself getting rid of things, but then slowly accumulating over and over. Like I think that's worth pursuing. Like what is it? What uh, like what is it inside of you that wants to go back to buying more and more things, especially things that you wouldn't need in life? And uh, and discovering what we discover isn't isn't always easy. Um, but it's uh, to tag onto that. It's it's a look. It's a different process. I think I say. I would say owning less is great, but wanting less is even better. Um, like getting down to a decluttered life is wonderful and fantastic and so good. But then, how do we break out of that desire to keep consuming? It's it's a different process, and it requires I think different questions. Um, but uh, certainly, that's where the real joy uh, takes place. I think one question over here, and then we'll probably wrap it up. Yeah, right there. Hi there. I just. I just wanted to thank you for sending your message. I'm actually a little bit there. I'm a better course. Yeah, good right times. And, um, and I've been following your writing for about a year, and it has changed my life. It helped me understand, um, it helped me take some ideas and make them a bit more organized about things that I wanted in my life. Um, so I can pretend it's a lot of talk, but I, I'm so happy. Thank you. I was uh, anyway, one quick story. I'll, and I'll end with it. When I when I started uh, minimizing, and I, I started um, like I found it very difficult at times. And I remember having a, a blog post one time where I was like, I, I'm shocked at how difficult this is at times. And someone left a comment, and they said, It seems to me that minimalism would force questions of value onto your life. And I said, that's exactly what it is. Like, I can't decide what I'm going to keep until I know what I want my life to be about. And it's a, a question that when we grow up and we're told to be consumers, uh, it's like our passion gets hijacked. And it's just all about buying more and more things. And if that's not what I'm going to be passionate about, what is important to me? And that's a difficult process that 
takes some people a day and it takes other people a lifetime to get there. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's such an important one, and it's one that I think uh, minimalism spurs uh, into our lives. So thank you. I appreciate your kind words um, so very much. Yeah, thank you.